Look, your muscles don't know you're vegan, right? I mean, the body runs on micronutrients and macronutrients, that's protein, carbs, and fat. And there really aren't any essential nutrients that you can't get without meat, except for vitamin B12, which both of the athletes I'm talking to today supplement with. And before you start thinking, if they have to take a supplement, their diets are incomplete, let's not forget that the vast majority of athletes I've interviewed on this channel, including many world record holders, take supplemental protein powder, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, multivitamins, and so on, and no one ever calls their diets incomplete because they're getting a little bit of help from supplements. Anyway, today I'm talking to two very successful plant-based athletes to give you an idea as to how they go about their nutrition. And like, they're not weird. Like, they get a gram of protein per pound of body weight, they have a macronutrient split that's pretty much exactly the same as all the other athletes I've spoken to, and they're both very, very strong. Derek Treesize has won three bodybuilding competitions, most notably in the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation in the physique category. And when he walks on stage at 5'11 and about 186 pounds, body fat gets down three to 4%, if I were to guess. I've deadlifted 500 pounds for a few reps, like two or three, um, and squat the same thing with 475. So not record-breaking weight by any means, but pretty heavy. Brady Crandall, meanwhile, is a state record-holding powerlifter in the American Powerlifting Federation. His records are a 617-pound deadlift and 1,505-pound total. He's also benched 345 pounds and squatted 565 pounds. And all four of those numbers I just mentioned are junior records in his federation because the lad is just 23 years old. Now, both of these athletes eat well over 3,000 calories. Right now, I eat uh, about 3,750 calories to maintain. When I'm trying to gain weight, I have to take it well over 4,000, but it totally depends on goals. As I mentioned, they get about a gram of protein per pound of body weight every day. Also, about 20% of their total calories come from fat, and the rest come from carbohydrates. And if you've ever heard any athlete talk about the nutrition, they pretty much always follow that same split. Is it harder to go low carbohydrate as a vegan? Yeah, it is. But are you going to be going low carb if your goal is to work out a ton and gain a bunch of strength and muscle? No, it, it's not, it's not gonna be that way. So we're gonna go into the potential benefits of going plant-based or more plant-based. But first I'm gonna answer the question that everyone wants to know, what do vegan athletes eat? We're gonna start with the less complicated one, the 241 pound powerlifter. Yeah, so 210 grams protein, 444 grams carbs, and 83 grams fat is where I'm at right now. That's Brady trying to lose a little bit of weight at 3,300 calories, but normally his calories are a lot closer to 4,000 per day. So here are his protein sources. I eat a lot of uh, nuts, seeds, legumes, so like a lot of lentils. Um, I eat uh, pepitas, which are pumpkin seeds. I eat a lot of tempeh, a lot of tofu, a lot of edamame, um, in, in addition, of course, to the, the plant-based meats. That's stuff like Beyond Burgers, meat substitutes, stuff you'll see that Derek the Bodybuilder doesn't eat very much of. So in a normal day though, Brady starts off with some high gluten special case cereal because gluten's a really good source of protein, fake chicken tacos with some veggies at lunch, a big stir fry for dinner with extra firm tofu because the firmness makes it higher in protein. He's also got a high pumpkin seed salad on the side and he also has a lot of fruit and a few protein shakes throughout the day with berries and juice. Derek Tree Size's diet again is a bit more whole food based. And it's really the same year round. I just changed portions and pre-portions of things. Um, I mean, breakfast is always oatmeal, like a cup and a half, half of steel kid oats with a whole apple chopped up in it. Post-workout, I always have a protein shake. I just use some unsweetened soy milk and a scoop of protein powder. It gives me like 30 grams of protein. Usually put some protein in there, nothing fancy. Lunch is always, always, always a massive green salad. You picture like a mixing bowl. It's like a green salad that big with half a block of tofu. I blacken it in the pan, throw that on top. Lots of veggies, balsamic vinegar. Uh, and then some kind of starchy thing on the side, you know, it could be like baked sweet potato, baked white potato. So uh, it could be like a bowl of lentil soup. In the off season, when calories are up, I will have banana ice cream just about every day I can get it after lunch. Really ripe bananas frozen and blended up with whatever kind of flavoring you want, like cocoa powder for chocolate or peanut butter for peanut butter. Or afternoon, every day, four or five o'clock. This is also year round. I have one of my famous bean shakes and the composition of that changes a lot depending on if I'm dieting or bulking or, or maintaining as well. It's always white beans. It always has berries. It always has leafy green vegetables. It usually has a banana unless I'm like right before a contest when I can't even afford one of those. But off season, I'll throw in dates and peanut butter and you know, walnuts and all this really high calorie stuff. And Derek's dinner varies. Like sometimes it'll be beans and rice, sometimes a stir fry. If he eats out, it'll be like Indian food or Thai food. But yeah, during the day, it's pretty much the exact same thing. Just the portions and proportions vary based on his body composition goals. 
As for supplements, Old Derek really takes the vitamin B12, vitamin D, and creatine, which Brady Crandall also takes, but he also adds into his supplement stack zinc, probiotics, and some glucosamine for joint support, which is a very common supplement among guys who are really lifting heavy a lot of the time. As a protein powder, Derek also takes some pea protein powder. It kind of depends on what he's got lying around, but pea is currently his favorite. Although we'll also often take a protein powder made from water lentils, which apparently have a really good amino acid profile. And speaking of amino acids, let's get into it. A really common argument you hear against vegan diets is that their protein sources are inferior or incomplete, meaning they don't contain all nine essential amino acids that humans can't produce on their own in sufficient amounts. But if you know a thing or two about nutrition, you would have heard those diets and realized that there's no way they're gonna be low in any amino acids. There are three main reasons why. Number one is they both eat soy, which is as complete a protein as meat. Number two, most of the other protein sources these guys are eating, like legumes, wheat, oatmeal, peas, protein powder, fake meat, even potatoes, these all are pretty good sources of the branch chain amino acids, which are the ones that are most closely associated with muscle protein synthesis, which is an important part of the whole muscle gain, muscle retention puzzle. Number three, the diets are really, really varied, which is a really important point here for amino acid variety. Most of the athletes I've spoken to who eat meat, they'll tend to eat the same few meals like over and over again, like the same basic meal templates, just to make meal planning a bit easier. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is most athletes I talk to, their carbohydrate sources are sweet potatoes, rice, and fruit, and that's about it. But the reason I'm emphasizing the variety for the vegan diets is that pretty much every dietetic association and sports nutrition association says that a well-planned vegan diet will give you all the amino acids in abundant amounts, especially if you're getting a lot of variety in your diet because all foods have amino acids in varying amounts. So if you have plenty of types of food, you don't really have to worry about the amino acids. So when someone's saying incomplete, they actually mean that it has less of some amino acids than they think you might need, but they're all still there. And you just eat a normal diet throughout the day that has some measure of diversity and you don't have to worry about it at all. All right, what else? Oh, soy. Okay, so a lot of people think that eating soy is going to make you more of a girly man. Like if you're not eating meat, you're gonna make him a big woman because soy contains a plant estrogen called phytoestrogen. And so people think that means it's going to increase your own estrogen or reduce your testosterone. One of the, the highly cited case studies is um, there was this elderly gentleman that um, developed gamma uh, which is enlarged male breasts. Note that this guy was 60 years old and drinking three liters of soy milk a day. Case studies, the only purpose of them is to kind of point researchers in, in a direction to say, hey, you should probably go look into this. So after that case study, they did go look into it and they found that the soy was, was probably not the cause of that. Yeah, a meta-analysis of 32 studies found that soy has no impact on your testosterone or your estrogen, and this included athletes and people eating up to 70 grams of soy protein a day. If you're very worried about this, I actually made a full, very good video about this right there that you can check out, where I go into like the different types of plant estrogen, how many of them have been linked to like actual health benefits because they're antioxidants. So some people actually deliberately add more estrogen to their diet. But long story short, all the good research shows that soy is not going to give you high estrogen, low testosterone, anything like that. Plus, if you're really worried about estrogen, you should probably know that plant estrogen is also in apples and coffee and oatmeal and a whole bunch of other foods you probably eat on the regular. So if you think you're totally avoiding plant estrogen by minimizing soy, so while this is not medical advice, speak to your physician if you're thinking about changing your diet, yeah, there are people who actually deliberately take more phytoestrogen for the potential health benefits. And this brings me to the last section of this video, three reasons you might want to consider maybe going vegan or more plant-based. Maybe not just forever, maybe for a little bit, maybe for a couple days a week, maybe now and then, but there are interesting studies that have shown some potential benefits to going plant-based. Number one, you're almost certainly going to drastically increase your micronutrient intake. Your intake of just about every vitamin and mineral that is out there, including a lot that people find hard to get in their regular diets, like magnesium, which is linked to better recovery, better sleep, and so on. Number two, you're probably gonna increase your fiber intake as well. And fiber is not just linked to better poops, although better poops are pretty great, but more fiber has been linked to a healthier gut microbiome. That's the uh, digestive tract in your body where there are trillions of bacteria living, which help you to break down nutrients and absorb nutrients. So more fiber does have some links to better nutrient absorption. Fiber goes down there, it cleans your colon, it provides a prebiotic for beneficial bacteria to make butyric acid and things. 
lower your blood pressure, improve your performance and your mental health and all these things. As a side note, it's smart to slowly increase your fiber intake day after day, week after week, as opposed to going straight from like a keto diet to a high fiber vegan diet. If you can do it slowly, that's gonna make it a lot easier for your gut to adjust to the higher amount of fiber. Although some people like to take digestive enzymes as well, just in case they have any digestive hiccups. The last possible benefit I wanna mention here is that there's actually a lot of evidence suggesting that reducing animal products in your diet makes your blood thinner. And that's not just a good thing because it could potentially reduce blood pressure. As an engineer, I kind of, I view the body as a machine. So I recognize that the circulatory system is really just a pump driving a series of pipes and valves and things like that. And one thing that any good chemical engineer will tell you is if you increase the viscosity of the fluid flowing through your pump, that's gonna damage the pump and decrease its efficiency. And where that comes on the performance benefit side, other than heart health, um, is it allows the, the blood to transport oxygen to your muscles a little quicker. Um, it helps them break that barrier between the muscle and the blood just a little bit faster. Um, and that can lead to a lot of benefits over time. Those studies we put on screen, by the way, did legit show that less animal products means thinner blood, which means better tissue oxygenation, which means better sports performance. It's very, very interesting stuff. Obviously, there are plenty of athletes who do eat animal products and they do perform very well, but these are still very interesting studies worth taking a look at. And if you want to, you can check out the full article that I put in the description below, where I include more of these interviews with Brady Crandall and Derek Treesize, including some stuff on omega-3 fatty acids that come from plants, which I was going to put in this video, but I mean, this video is probably long enough already. So make sure you subscribe to Barben for more fitness and nutrition videos and athlete interviews. I really want to thank Derek Treesize and Brady Crandall for coming on the channel today. And by the way, Brady Crandall has a book coming out this summer on the benefits of being a plant-based athlete. It's called... The Living Machine, Engineering Strength with a Plant-Based Diet. Uh, I put links to everything in the description below. Uh, thanks for watching.